Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today, Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1. And, and I want you to think and uh, imagine what it would be like for if you went to a doctor and the doctor diagnosed you with a disease that would cause you to have to uh, give up your home. Uh, it would cause you to not be able to have any contact with your family whatsoever. Uh, in fact, not only your family, but mankind in general. No contact, no communication allowed. And that you'd have to leave the, the, the town that you lived in. You couldn't live with other people. And basically all you have is what you could carry with you. Well, that's what the diagnosis of leprosy did for one who was of Israel. And they were seen as being dead, uh, the walking dead, if you will. The, the body of a leper already in the uh, decomposition stages, dying, if you will. And today we're going to be covering the restoration or purification of a leper. Uh, certainly the majority of the people who contracted leprosy died from the disease and it was a terrible death. But from time to time, and God, I'll remind you once again, leprosy, zaroth in the Hebrew, uh, which means uh, is the word for leprosy. The prime of it though is zarah, which means to be stricken down. And leprosy, when someone got leprosy, they were seen as one who had been stricken of the Lord. And therefore, when someone was rid of the disease and, and cured of leprosy, it was seen as a, uh, the grace of God and, and really bringing them back to life is what we're going to be talking about today, <clears throat> the restoration and purification of a leper. Now in verses 2 through 8, we're going to first be talking about the restoration of a leper that's been purified or cleansed, uh, rid of the leprosy with man. And then in verses 9 through 20, we're going to be talking about the restoration of the leper with a, a covenant relationship with the Lord. Uh, consecration much like uh, the priest went through in chapter 8 of Leviticus, uh, it was required to restore uh, the, the, the fellowship with the Lord. So with that, let's uh, ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Let's go with uh, Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1, and it reads, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and this is addressed to uh, Moses alone, Aaron not being addressed in this case, uh, Moses, of course, the lawgiver. Verse 2, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest. And this word brought, not a, a good translation. There is absolutely no way that a leper would be brought into the city, much less to the priest, which the priest most likely would be at the tabernacle, uh, the mosaic tent at this point in time. Uh, so the, this word brought, check it out in the Hebrew, it means to go or come. And in the next several verses, we're going to see that the priest actually goes to the leper. The leper will see capable of doing nothing on their own at this point in time. Anytime I think about the cleansing of a leper too, uh, I can't help but think about 2 Kings uh, chapter 5 where uh, Naaman, uh, was, uh, he was a, a Gentile uh, that 
came to uh, Elijah, Elisha and uh, was told that Elisha could heal him. And you remember Elisha told him, you go down to uh, the river uh, Jordan and you dunk yourself seven times in, in the river and you'll be cleansed. And it kind of made Nam and mad. He was said, you know, you know, the waters of Damascus, uh, not sufficient that I could have dunked myself seven times in those. And, but uh, his, his counselors said, look, you know, he didn't give you some hard, difficult thing for you to do. He said, go down to the Jordan and dunk yourself in seven times and be cured. And he was cured. Verse 3. And the priest shall go forth out of the camp. And here that's better translated. The priest goes out of the camp to the leper. And the priest shall look and behold if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. And in Matthew chapter 8 uh, verses 1 through 4, uh, Jesus gives credentials to uh, Moses as the writer of the book of Leviticus. It states there in Matthew 8, 4, that, uh, 8, 1 through 4, that a leper walked up to Jesus and said, you know, if you wanted to heal me, uh, you could. I know you could. And Jesus said, be clean, be healed, and take your sacrifice as Moses told you to do. And of course, Mo he was, Jesus was referring to what we're going to be covering here to take your sacrifice to the priest and, and be cleansed. Verse 4, Then shall the priest command to take for him, that is to be cleansed, two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. More on the cedar wood, the scarlet, and the hyssop in just a moment or two. But uh, what we're going to have happen here is these are going to be uh, a, a cleansing of the leper, a purification of the leper. Verse 5, And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. And this is not translated very well at all. The running water, uh, living water, as a running stream, if you will, as opposed to a stagnant pond. And of course, the living water of the New Testament is Jesus Christ, John chapter 4, verse 10. But uh, what's being done here is the, the blood of the one bird is uh, going to be mixed with the running water, verse 6. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood uh, and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them in the living bird and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. Now, cedar wood always known for uh, or symbolic of continuance of life. For example, an evergreen, uh, uh, green even throughout the winter months. Uh, scarlet, known and symbolic of vital energy. Uh, hyssop, uh, known for its uh, 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 purification. It's also uh, known as a uh, well, purification is, is a good thing. All these ingredients you may recall and, and uh, we'll see when we get to chapter 19 uh, are the ingredients that make up along with the ashes of a red heifer uh, make up the purification for contact with the dead. Now what's going on here is the the, the two birds are both symbolic of something, two different things. The bird that's killed is symbolic of the leprosy, and the leprosy is going to be dead in this one who is purified. The live bird is symbolic of the leper, uh, and that God, although he was dead, is now going to be alive because of the grace and mercy of God. Verse 7, And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times. And here we see it readmission re into the covenant. Seven, not only uh, spiritual completeness, but the stamp of the covenant. And shall pronounce him clean. 
and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. And again, this bird's symbolic of the freedom that's restored to he who had the leprosy. The leprosy put the person in chains. Uh, as I said at the introduction, uh, they weren't allowed to have any contact with other people. Uh, they had to live away from other people. And that, that's being in chains. Uh, the free bird symbolic of the one who is freed from the chains of leprosy. Verse 8. And he that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shall shave off all his hair and wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that he shall come into the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days. Now there are a wide variety of explanations among the scholars and many have difficulty. And I don't think any of them do a real good job of explaining why he had to stay out of his tent, his home, if you will, for seven days. Uh, some uh, scholars point out that, well, if he stayed in his tent, uh, his conjugal privileges might cause him to make himself unclean again. But we'll see when we get to chapter 15 that that doesn't hold water because if you did exercise conjugal rights, then you were only unclean for until even, and then you wash, not for the seven days. Uh, some say it's in the uh, preparation. He didn't want to interrupt his preparation for uh, readmission to fellowship with the Lord. Again, I don't think anyone explains this verse very well. Verse 9, But it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave all his hair off his head and his beard, and his eyebrows, again shaving. Even all his hair he shall shave off, and he shall wash his clothes. Also he shall wash his flesh in water, and he shall be clean. Clean on the first day, uh, now free to enjoy it. And uh, the seven days preparing him and leading up to the readmission to the uh, uh, fellowship with God, and that's what we're going to be talking about in verse 10 and following verses. <clears throat> and on the eighth day, eight in biblical numerics, new beginnings, he shall take two he lambs without blemish, always the sacrifices. We see that type for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was crucified uh, without spot, without blemish. He was perfect and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, and three tenth deals of fine flour for a meat offering, minka in the Hebrew, mingled with oil, and one log of oil. A log is a, a measurement equivalent to approximately two-thirds of a pint uh, of what a measure that we would be familiar with uh, in, in this time. Now, the oil uh, mingled with the offering, always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. I think that the, the log of oil was ordinary olive oil at this point in time. And we're going to see that the oil is uh, utilized in a way that it's uh, set apart, consecrated, uh, and set apart into anointing oil uh, by the priest. <clears throat> Verse 11, uh, any of you who use olive oil uh, in, in anointing, you know that you take a small amount of the oil and in prayer you ask God to bless the oil, uh, and it explaining to him, that promising him that you'll only use it in obedience to him and uh, you know it's his power, not the power of the oil. Verse 11, and the priest that maketh him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The priest shall cause the man to stand. And again, notice all is done for the leper. The leper can do nothing uh, on his own at this point in time until his relationship with man, number one, is restored and his relationship, number two, with the Lord is restored. <clears throat> Verse 12, 
And the priest shall take one he lamb and offer him for a trespass offering and the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And this trespass offering in the Hebrew is asham and it's for uh, sins of omission, uh, something that someone did not do, in other words, uh, in ignorance or negligence. And just as the priests who were consecrated into the priesthood uh, through a consecration process in chapter 8, uh, here we see basically the same setup. <clears throat> Verse 13, And he, this being the priest, shall slay the lamb in the place where the, he shall kill the sin offering, this being on the, the north side of the altar of burnt offering, and the burnt offering uh, in the holy place, for as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering, it is most holy. And this could be easily misinterpreted that the sin offering is for the sins of the priest. That's not what's being said here at all. The sin offering is to cover the sins of the leper. And uh, what this means is that the sin offering is the priest, as it's stated in chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 7 and the following verses that the priests were to consume the sin offerings of the people, uh, in essence, uh, getting rid of the sin, bear the iniquity of the people, as it states in chapter 10, verse 17, verse 14. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. The great toe, of course, what we would refer to as the big toe today. Now, this is all symbolic, and it's just as we saw in chapter 8 for Aaron and his sons, that they took the blood of the consecration ram and touched it to Aaron and his son's right ear, uh, their right thumbs, and their right big toes. And this is uh, symbolic of, 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 number one, hearkening or listening to the Word of God uh, on the ear, on the thumb, uh, working to accomplish the, the Word of God, and then on the big toe, uh, walking according to the Word of God. And again, this was just like uh, the priest consecration, but here required to restore uh, the covenant relationship between the leper and God. Verse 15, And the priest shall take some of the log of oil, the two-thirds of a pint of the ordinary olive oil, and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. And the oil always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord, before the altar of burnt offering. And this, I think we can, in this we can see uh, the, the priest consecrating or setting apart this oil for use for anointing, much as you would do if you were obtained some new olive oil and were uh, preparing it to be anointing oil, uh, consecrating the oil and sanctifying it for further use. Verse 17, And of the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put upon, upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot, upon the blood of the trespass offering. And, and this is all symbolic. The, the blood uh, is what God chose to be the means of atonement for man. The, the wages of sin is death. And to, uh, at the, this point in time of this writing, the book of Leviticus, that was how you atone for sin, was the blood of sacrifices. The oil, uh, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, 
uh, the, the blood being equivalent to the soul of the person, if you will, together they endowed uh, the person with the uh, power of the Holy Spirit once again. Verse 18, And the remnant of the oil that is in the priest's hands he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed, thus anointing him. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord. And now this individual would be uh, reinstated in, to covenant uh, privileges, uh, covenant rights. In other words, they would be free to uh, participate in things such as, well, making an offering to the Lord, a burnt offering. Uh, got to get rid of the sin first, but then also the peace offerings where the person would have the right to participate in a sacrificial meal with God. That privilege would be reinstated at this point. Also participating in Passover. Uh, someone who's unclean cannot participate in Passover. Verse 19, And the priest shall offer the sin offering and make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterward he shall kill the burnt offering. Always the sin offering first, and then the burnt offering. The burnt offering, you may recall, we covered in chapter 1 of Leviticus, and that is a total surrender to God. Uh, it was also seen as an approach offering, allowing one to come into the presence of God, His holiness. Verse 20, And the priest shall offer a burnt offering, and the meat offering, the minka that was mentioned in uh, verse 10, and the meat offering upon the altar. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, and he shall be clean. Now, uh, the importance of the details of this law that we've just covered are so important that it's repeated uh, almost word for word, every point is repeated in verses 21 uh, through 32. And I'm not going to bore you with uh, reading the same material to you again. I will mention there's one uh, small uh, addition to the law in verses 21 through 32, and that is the fact that if someone was not able to afford the larger sacrifices, the ewe, uh, sheep, and, and, and the ram, then they were allowed to, in other words, they didn't have the means to buy a, a ram for the sacrifice. They were allowed to bring two turtle doves or two pigeons, which of course uh, were also clean animals, but uh, God never showed favoritism as far as how much money someone has, how much money they're able to give to the church, for example. Uh, it doesn't affect God at all. Uh, he's more impressed with people being interested in learning His Word and doing His Word rather than being hearers of the Word but not doers. So, and we're going to skip then to verse 33 and we'll pick it up there. And what we're going to be talking about now is leprosy that is seen in, in, a, in a home, in a house. And I'll remind you that God is preparing Israel to move into the land of Canaan. And God gave the people of Israel the houses, the very homes that the Canaanites lived in. Uh, they didn't have to dig wells. God, all that was done by the Canaanites. The olive yards were planted. The vineyards were planted. Uh, God gave them everything that they needed to produce fruit. Unfortunately, in, as it's written in Isaiah chapter 5, God expected them to produce fruit, uh, but what He got was poison berries, which is is what the wild grape should have been translated in Isaiah chapter 5. But uh, the point is, there have been some very, very unclean people living in these homes. And more on that as we work our way through verse 33. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, and this uh, pertains a lot to the priest, so that's the reason that uh, the Lord is speaking to both Moses and Aaron. Verse 34, 
When ye be come into the land of Canaan, the promised land, which I give to you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession. Now, who put the plague of leprosy in the house? Uh, God struck that home with leprosy. Uh, Zaroth, uh, the prime in the Hebrew, Zara, of, of a man who, or a woman who was, or a child who was stricken with leprosy. G who did it? God did it. Verse 35, And he that owneth the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, It seemeth to me there is a, as it were a plague in the house. Make a note of Psalm uh, 91, verses 9 and 10, where it states that if you will make the Lord your habitation, there will be no plague uh, that comes near uh, thy dwelling. Verse 36, Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest go in in it to see the plague, that all that is in the house be not made unclean, and afterward the priest shall go in to see the house. Now, this proves to me that, that this leprosy, as it's called here, was not actually infectious. Uh, what this is saying is that uh, before the priest would go in to declare the house clean or unclean, they were to get the contents out of the house, completely move all the furniture out of the house. And for the reason that if the priest pronounced the house unclean, it would also mean the contents were unclean. So until the priest said it was unclean, they could still get the furniture, the contents, out of the house and therefore at least save their furniture in the event that the house had to be demolished. Verse 37, And he shall look on the plague, the priest being the he, and behold, if the plague be on the walls of the house with hollow strakes, greenish or reddish, which, is in, which in sight are lower than the wall, in other words, it had uh, sunken places uh, that were recessed from the uh, level of the wall. Uh, indentions in the wall might be a good way to think of it that were greenish or reddish. And this is all symbolic. Just as uh, the leper was seen as someone who was dead and, and already de in the decom decomposition uh, process, decomposing process, so is the house in this case, uh, decomposing from within. Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut the house seven days, the same as the procedure if a man was suspected or a woman was suspected of having leprosy, the same if a garment was uh, suspected of having leprosy. The procedure put it away for seven days and what are we looking for? We're looking for any signs of change in that seven day period. Verse 39, <clears throat> And the priest shall come again the seventh day and shall look. And behold, if the plague is spread in the walls of the house, and let me ask you, do you think it's spreading is a good sign? or a bad sign. Well, it's spreading either in a man or in a garment or in a house was a bad sign. Again, the spreading a sign of inward corruption. Verse 40, Then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which the plague is, and they shall cast them into an unclean place without the city, removing the corruption from the camp just as a, a man who was diagnosed with leprosy had to leave the camp, uh, just as a garment who uh, had leprosy that could not be uh, washed or cured was burned, effectively removing it from the camp, the bricks that were affected in the home or the stones were taken out away from the camp to an unclean place and gotten rid of. Verse 41, 
and he shall cause the house to be scraped within around about, and they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off without the city in an unclean place. And the walls at this time were uh, plastered, and it was quite a process. Not only did they have to take the walls, the, the affected part of the walls, the rocks and the bricks out, they had to scrape the entire uh, plaster off of the walls and not only remove the plaster, but the dust from it outside of the camp into an unclean place. All, all symbolic of sin, get, get the sin away from the people, away from the camp. Verse 42, And they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones. They'll patch the hole in the wall. And he shall take other mortar and shall plaster the house. And hopefully uh, the plague won't return. Uh, and a further cleansing of the house required even if it does not return. And if the plague come again and break out in the house, after that he hath taken away the stones, and after he hath scraped the house, and after it is plastered, the reappearance of the uh, indentions uh, into the walls, a bad sign. It means that the leprosy has come back. Verse 44, Then the priest shall come and look, and behold, if the plague be spread in the house, it is a fretting leprosy in the house. It is unclean. And a fretting leprosy meaning it's uh, bitter or mad, uh, corruption growing from within. 45, what happens in that case that it came back? And he shall break down the house. Better, <clears throat> the priest shall cause the house to be broken down. The stones of it and the timber thereof and all the mortar of the house, the whole house. And he shall carry them forth out of the city into an unclean place, completely removing the corruption from the camp just as a person who was diagnosed with leprosy was removed from the camp, just as a garment that was diagnosed with leprosy that was incurable was removed from the camp uh, by burning. We'll come back in our next lecture and complete the, uh, the sections of Leviticus that cover uh, leprosy. Uh, we'll also get into chapter 15, uh, which is the uncleanness of bodily secretions. And once again, I'll remind you viewers that chapter 15 in particular is pretty mature subject matter. Uh, I won't pull any punches as we work our way through chapter 15, but I did want to give you, I know many of you study with your children, with your grandchildren, and I wanted to give you the heads up and make you aware that it is subject, uh, mature subject matter. Uh, and perhaps it would be best for you to record the program, review it yourself, and then make sure that you're ready to discuss that uh, mature uh, subject matter with your children or your grandchildren. Uh, I'll leave that determination to you, but we're going to teach it uh, line by line, precept upon precept. And uh, we've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment. Won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4673. 
4645, that number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to share to be possibly answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Please don't ask for questions in a written form. We just don't have the time or staff to give a written response to everyone or anyone who would like one. If we don't have time to do it for everyone, uh, we won't do it for one. Please don't ask questions about a specific denomination, organization, or individual by name. We teach God's Word in a positive format. Uh, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. Uh, if you're watch, uh, studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in. Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need a telephone number. We can do away with that. You don't need paper and pencil and a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to develop your relationship with your Heavenly Father. You might say, well, how do I develop my relationship with God? Well, talking with Him is a good start. And, you know, He developed a way for you to talk with Him anywhere, anytime, any place. You can talk to your Heavenly Father in prayer. And that's a good way to develop your relationship. Be sure and tell your Father that you love Him if you do. You can't con Him. Don't try and con Him because He knows your heart and He knows your mind. We do have these prayer requests. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, uh, addictions to drugs, alcohol, Father, uh, financial difficulties. You know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We ask that you watch over, direct, and, and again, we lift, always remember our military troops in harm's way, Father. We ask you to protect them in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks across the country. First up today, Alicia in California. When the silver cord breaks, does the flesh die and the spirit? No, the, the, the flesh dies most assuredly and the silver cord, Alicia is referring to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12 verses 6 and 7. And what the silver cord breaking is a, a Hebraism, a, a figure of speech in the Hebrew language that means when we die. And verse 7 goes on to say, uh, verse 6 is where it says when the silver cord uh, parts. And then it goes on to say something like in the uh, earthen vessel be broken. It uh, means when we die. Uh, well, it states then that the dust, meaning the flesh, returns to the earth and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Uh, that's what happens when we die. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 state that to be absent from the flesh body is to be present with the Lord. Dale in Washington, do I still have to pay for my sins even though the Lord has forgiven me? No, you don't pay for sins that you have been, uh, that you have repented of and been forgiven. Acts uh, chapter 3, verse 19 will document that those sins are blotted out. That, that means that uh, they don't exist anymore. It's like they never existed in the first place. Jonathan in Texas, and you know, once a sin has been blotted out, the most important thing is it's erased next to your name in the books that God keeps in heaven. You're not going to be judged on those sins that are erased. That's why a Christian should repent and repent often. Jonathan in Texas, if we die before Jesus comes, are there two paradises, that good and the bad? Well, there are, there's only one paradise, but there are two sides of the gulf. Uh, one side of the gulf is not all that pleasant. Uh, read Luke chapter 16 and see how the rich man uh, who died at the same time Lazarus did was tormented, but on the side of Lazarus, who was seen in the bosom of Abraham, things are quite different. That was where I would call paradise. Second Esdras, 
uh, chapter 7, verse 77, if you happen to have an apocrypha, even gives a better description of the bad side of the gulf than Luke chapter 16 does. Then you follow with the second question, is there a way to go from the bad side to the good? And no, that's the thing about the gulf of Luke chapter 16. You cannot cross it. It's impossible to cross at this point in time. <clears throat> Louisa from Texas. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus and greetings to you as well. I need help. Would you please tell me or expound on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Is this talking about the catching away departure or is it talking about the apostasy and the Antichrist? Thank you. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, uh, Paul says, you know, I want to talk to you about the return of Jesus Christ. And that return is not going to happen until there first be a great falling away. Uh, if you look in the Greek, that means an apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. There's only one son of perdition. Uh, some people try and say that's Judas Iscariot. It's not Judas Iscariot. It's Satan himself. Satan is the only entity, individual, that has been judged to death by name already. Uh, and then you'll read about that in Ezekiel uh, chapter 27, I believe it is, where he's called the king of Tyrus, but he's already been sentenced to, to be turned to ashes from within. That happens when he goes into the lake of fire. That's Ezekiel 27 or 28. It escapes me at the moment. Jeannie in Arkansas, thank you and the staff for what you do. You're welcome. Uh, I wanted you all to know that the Father healed me through the Son from hepatitis C. My husband and I uh, found you at 2.30 a.m. one morning and we learned. We repented and we were healed in a few years without taking uh, new prescriptions, medications. We've been with your church for at least 20 years. I thought this might be good for others who made the, who made the same mistakes that we did to hear. And thanks for witnessing and sharing that witness with us. God's Word is so powerful. It, it does change lives. And I encourage you, if you are having addiction problems or something of that nature, or have a, a disease, get, get, get into God's Word, and God has the power to heal. Tommy in Iowa, if you don't study your Bible, will you go to hell? Well, I would say it's probably more likely uh, that you would end up in the lake of fire. Uh, if you don't read the letter God wrote to you, you don't know how to be pleasing to God. You don't know what makes God angry. Um, in a nutshell, if you don't know God's commandments, you can't do His commandments. And if you don't follow God's commandments, yeah, the, the likelihood of you ended up in the lake of fire of Revelation chapter 20 is probably increased. Kathy, and I don't know where Kathy's from, is the world going to end? Well, any place in the Bible that it talks about end time prophecy or the end of the world. It's talking about periods of time, an age, if you will. In the Greek, the word is aion, and it means a period of time. And we are living right now in the second earth and heaven age. Uh, when the first, the second earth and heaven age ends, guess what happens? The third earth and heaven, which is the eternity, uh, begins in uh, that period. Of when the one period of time ends, the next period of time begins. So, no, the world is not going to be uh, destroyed in some apocalyptic uh, disaster. Uh, God loves uh, the area of Jerusalem. He married that area and that's where his throne will be established in the eternity. 
How do I know? Because Revelation chapter 21 tells us that that's the way it comes down. Al in Connecticut, where in Scripture does it talk about Easter? Only appears in the King James Version Bible in one verse, Acts chapter 12, verse 4, and that is a poor translation. The word in the Greek is Pascha, and that, what does Pascha mean? Well, if you've got a Strong's Concordance, you can look it up. It means Passover and Jesus Christ became our Passover, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Easter, uh, if you have a Webster's 7th college, uh, 7th edition college uh, dictionary, you can look up the word Easter, and it will tell you that that is a pagan spring festival, uh, an orgy, if you will, in the groves, rolling Easter eggs, which are symbolic of fertility, uh, quick like a rabbit, an Easter bunny, uh, known for also for their uh, fertility, their reproduction capabilities. Uh, it originated as, uh, as a, a goddess of the Phoenicians who uh, was the goddess of fertility. Uh, if you want a full study on the, the subject of Easter, I would suggest you order a, a CD by Pastor Arnold Murray entitled just that, Easter. It's CD 30573. Edward in South Carolina. What was Noah's wife's name and where can I find it in the Bible? Noah's wife nor his three daughters-in-law are mentioned by name. Robert in, in the Bible, Robert in South Carolina, could you tell me where I can find the verse each after its own kind and doth not nature itself teach you that it is so? I was taught that way as a young man growing up. I have used that as my guide many times and would like to read more about it. Only one place in the King James Version Bible that it says that nature itself teaches us. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And uh, that subject is, if a man has long hair, it is a shame unto him. Now, to each his own, I think Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19 would get that such there that Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind, meaning a, diver, a different kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. You know, God created things just the way he wants them. And when you go cross-gendering uh, or mixing the seed, uh, you're getting away, you're getting something, a result that's not natural according to God. Joseph in Pennsylvania, why was Dan and Ephraim omitted from the 12 tribes of Israel? And Joseph referring to Revelation chapter 7. And Dan and Ephraim are omitted from the listing of the 12 tribes of Israel there because of their idolatry. But uh, and Joseph and Levi are listed in the place of Dan and Ephraim there in Revelation chapter 7. However, in Ezekiel 48, which is future from now, uh, Dan and Ephraim will be reinstated uh, for the eternity. Deborah from Ohio, um, thank you so much for teaching Father's Word the way it needs to be taught uh, in all churches. I have a question about the millennium. Is it only the Zadok that can go out and talk to family members or any spirit body with an immortal soul or both? Only the Zadok, which are the elect of God, those who partake of the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, uh, meaning that the second death, the death of the soul, has no power over them. Uh, they have an immortal soul at that time, 
because of the first uh, uh, resurrection of Revelation 20. Not all Christians in the millennium are considered the Zadok, correct? And that is uh, correct. And you say thank you and thank you. All right, who we have? Evelyn from Florida. Uh, I've learned a lot, but not enough. I still haven't heard my question. Well, you're about to. About angels. Is it wrong to collect images of angels? I don't worship them, but I believe God uses them to help us uh, and watch over us. Well, there's nothing wrong with images of anything as long as you, as you said you don't worship them. Now, there's a scripture that talks about what you're talking about, that angels uh, watch over uh, certain people. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, the teachings of Jesus, he says, don't despise one of these little ones, referring to his election. For I say unto you that their angels in heaven do always behold the face of Father. In other words, it's the angels watching over God's election, and at any time he has the attention of God would be a way to think of that. Erica in Texas, and thank you for your kind comments. Where was Jesus from the age of 12 until age 30, and what was he doing? Well, Jesus' ministry began at the age of approximately 30 years old, and he kind of disappears in the New Testament from the age of 12 to the age of 30. Uh, historically, you can uh, document that Jesus was traveling back and forth from uh, Judah to uh, the, the British Isles with his uncle, Joseph, or actually Mary's uncle, his great, great uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, who uh, was a tin man. And, uh, in other words, they mined tin in Great Britain, and uh, he was in a import business to bring the tin back to uh, Judah. So uh, there's a book entitled Traditions of Glastonbury. There's a documentary on it that we run occasionally. You might catch that uh, on video or DVD or cassette tape, or excuse me, VHS tape. We offer both in our library. Or you can order book six, Traditions of Glastonbury, which uh, gives a pretty uh, good evidence of, of the fact that Jesus uh, was traveling uh, back and forth, as I said, with his great uncle, Joseph of Arimathea. Cadence from Kentucky. I want to get baptized, but I don't know what I have to do to be baptized. I'm only nine years old, and my preacher says that I have to take a class in order to be baptized. What kind of class do I have to take? Well, you need to ask that preacher that if you want to be baptized in their church, you have to follow their rules. I can't tell you, though, that any Christian may baptize another person. It doesn't have to be a preacher of a church. Uh, and I would uh, hate to be in that preacher's shoes if he refused to baptize you and then you were, God forbid, killed in an automobile accident while you were waiting to get through this class, I'd sure hate to be in that preacher's shoes. But uh, we don't require anyone to take a class uh, here at Shepherd's Chapel. Uh, the, if someone is extremely young and, and asking to be baptized, you're always going to see the pastor uh, verify that the young person knows what they're doing and, and, and is old enough to make a responsible, cognizant uh, decision that what they're doing is their own will, not mommy or daddy's or uh, not doing it because somebody else in Sunday school, peer pressure is, is causing them to be baptized, but that they uh, want to be baptized uh, for the right reasons. Wendy in Kentucky. I'm confused about the mercy seat. If it was intended for Christ to 
absolve us and give mercy from why was Satan one of the angels that covered it. Uh, there would be no need for mercy if there was no sin before Satan rebelled. I'm confused. Well, man does not need Satan uh, to figure out a way to sin. Man is <laughs> pretty good at coming up with ways to sin on their own without Satan's help. To answer your question, Satan earned the right to be one of the uh, cherubs that protects the mercy seat. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 11 in the following verses. Uh, but he, And he was doing good, Satan was, all until he got all puffed up in himself. And that is the scripture I, that had escaped me. It is Ezekiel 28 where the king of Tyrus, and because he got all puffed up on an ego trip, that's when God sentenced Satan to death and I'm not talking about the death of the flesh, I'm talking about the second death, the death of the soul, and he'll be turned to ashes from within when he goes into the lake of fire. Kimberly in Idaho, please explain and provide scripture for what is the key of David. I'm not completely sure. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 7, the key of David is the key that opens doors that no man can shut them and it shuts doors that no man can open them. The key of David is the key that unlocks scripture. It opens it to where you understand and you know who the Kenites are, which are the, uh, the, the of the synagogue of Satan of Revelation chapter 2, 7 and 3, 7. Got to know the key of David. I'm out of time, way out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal. I also want you to know that we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this though, beloved, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.